and violence. So. Hey everyone, welcome to season three, episode two of the now caregiving and entrepreneurship reimagined podcast. I am your caregiver coach and business coach, Melissa Miller. And I thank you for joining me for this episode because today we are going to be talking about self-care in the form of advocacy for yourself when you're in a medical appointment with your loved one, or even for yourself, if you're immunocompromised or your loved one is immunocompromised, because with the, uh, the concern is with um, COVID still ongoing, but the hospitals and doctor's offices pulling back on the, re on the requirements for PPE or protective, um, you know, protective personal equipment for those of you not in the medical space, it's a concern because we obviously don't want ourselves to get sick if we are immunocompromised or if we're caring more importantly for someone who is immunocompromised. And to help me talk about this topic, I am so excited to invite back my good friends, Claire and Armithia from Sister Creatives. They were on the podcast in season two, I believe. And I am so glad that they agreed to come back. And they've been going on this journey of kind of a little bit of a shift and rebrand with their business as well. So it's kind of a twofold thing where we're both kind of on this journey of uh, caregiving and entrepreneurship together. And I think they could be a great force and voice to share in this drive for advocacy for self-care and um, and making sure that caregivers and the, those that they're caring for are safe when it comes to getting help from the medical system to be safe. So Claire, Amentia, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. And I'm so excited to dive into what's happened since I last time had you on. It has been a while. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's been since like January and, um, yeah, like you said, and like we were discussing, we both had a shift in our niche. Um, we just hype kind of hyper focused more on disability, um, especially invisible disabilities and um, people who are immunocompromised. And, um, we have shifted more into also, a, um, accessibility with our, our advocacy, what we do with Sister Creatives Rising. Um, and yeah, you want to kind of go into that more? Yeah, um, because as we went along, uh, we realized as the, as we went along, we realized as things were shifting as, as the COVID protections, the time for the COVID protections got closer, we realized that we were getting anxious and we were seeing, seeing anxiety with the people we communicated with as well. And then um, when it happened on May 11th, it was like, it was a shock. It ran through, it was like a shock. You could see it in online and everything. And people were immediately like, oh my goodness. Because immediately we got a text that night or it was a, an alert that no masks were required at the hospitals anymore. It was immediately, I remember it came through. Mm -hmm. And we were like, Oh my goodness. Be because before then, I didn't really, as a person who's in a can uh, recovering from cancer and have to go for two month checks, you know, I didn't think about ev everyone around me within the last year as I went through my, my cancer situation were wearing masks all the time. Mm -hmm. So I never really. I didn't have that extra stress. I had other stresses in my life, but I knew when I went to my doctor appointment, I felt like I was, I didn't have to worry. Mm -hmm. And immediately, um, as soon as that happened, I immediately felt the stress hit. And it felt like it was one more thing that was layered upon everything else that I have to deal with in my life right now. And for me, going to the doctor or going to the hospital, I always felt safe and cared for because everyone one around me masked. And I was like, began hearing stories of people who were going to the doctor and having getting into arguments with their doctors, with nurses who were taking care of them. With oncologists. With oncologists. Endocrinologists. Endocrinologists were arguing about why they shouldn't wear masks. It's like, oh my goodness, I have these so many appointments to to do mm -hmm. in the coming year and it's it's just been very stressful and I feel it every day I worry about the next appointment who I'm going to run into you know um that who I'm going to have to convince that it's important to wear a mask not just the surgical mask now because I'm 
immunocompromised. I have underlying um, pulmonary disease. Pulmonary disease. You have like three comorbidities. 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 And yeah. I am dealing with uh, the cancer situation still. So every time you go in there, you might meet a nurse that have a different view on it. And I try to set up everything. I send letters. I I um, call before I go into my appointment. Please wear, I need you to wear N95, not just a surgical. The reason why I ask for N95 is because it's better fit. It fits better. And I feel more comfortable when I go into the appointment. I don't feel as stressed because I have complex P PTSD, panic disorder, and agoraphobia. So it helps me not to have anxiety when I go to the doctor. And so I ask for them to wear that mask that fits better because in the room, not the people that I meet, not the secretaries or whatever outside, when they're in just the room, when I'm in a closed room with the person yeah. who is going to be interacting with me, we're N95 and, and there's a fight. And so we are seeing this with other people as well. So it's just really very stressful time. Yeah. And I, you know, we were talking about this before we even started this um, episode is that I was a, excuse me, I was a certified nursing assistant for 15 years in my healthcare um, career. And it's the same kind of thing. When I was a CNA, practiced as a CNA, there'd be times where we'd have patients that were in isolation. And so for safety, you know, we'd either, depending on the level of their illness, we would, you know, wear masks, obviously gloves or gloves are a no-brainer across the board, whether they're sick, they're really sick in isolation or not. But, you know, masks, um, gowns, booties, hats, you know, whatever it might need to be for safety. But the same thing is true for us as the workers. If we were starting to feel sick or we were or something like that, we would, you know, have the wherewithal to put a mask on and just wash our hands and just be careful um, so we wouldn't get our patients sick. And so I think the same kind of rules apply here from the um, healthcare industry and the clinics that um, it doesn't have to be for everybody. I mean, obviously we want to be people safe, but if you specifically know that your next patient has, um, looking at their chart and their nose to see, cause they eyeball their chart before they walk into talk with you to see, to refresh their memory on where you're at. Mm -hmm. If you know they're immunocompromised, please wear a mask. <laughs> It cannot yeah. help. It's the same thing as when I was a need, like, you know, we would practice, you know, like, if you know, you're going in to work with someone that's even more susceptible that, you know, not just washing your hands and wearing gloves is enough, wear a mask, exactly. <laughs> you know, to protect as a courtesy to keep both the more importantly, the patient safe, but also you safe because you don't know. So, and, and I can understand how it could feel like I can see both ends of the spectrum. I didn't, you know, like up until from January through May of 2020, I was, you know, wearing a mask all the time at work for my whole shift when I was still practicing as, as an aide. And that was just the, 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 you know, tip of the iceberg point, you know, we weren't hardcore into it as much as like by the end of 2020 into 2021, we were for being shut down and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that from a healthcare worker perspective, just always having to wear a mask. You can't breathe for those of us who wear glasses. It bogs up our glasses. We can't see a thing. <laughs> and so I understand the uncomfortableness of it, but more importantly, as a healthcare worker or ex former healthcare worker for me now, um, it's still important that we serve our clients and our customers to the best of our ability by keeping them safe. And if that means for that 15 to 30 minute interaction that we're with them, that we wear a mask to keep them safe, we should be doing that. That we, and, and, if not, and if nothing else, like um, what Claire was touching on, or the mental and emotional peace of mind for that patient. Because like Claire said, she has panic and anxiety and stress. And so what can we do to keep them safe in terms of even just doing that just out of common courtesy and respect, okay? We're not saying that you have to, that doctors and nurses have to do this with everybody or we're trying to push that on everybody, but at least for the ones that we know they're at a higher risk for even just interacting with the public. and. Yeah they're doing what they can to be homebound, but for medical appointments, it's obviously very necessary that they go in to see their, their medical professionals. Can we have the medical professionals just really take that into account? Cause it is serious. It's all, it could be a life and death thing if their immune system crashes. That's what we're getting at here. It's not to say that the medical system is all bad and that they're out to get us. It's just maybe just instilling a little bit more of advocacy for the patient's from their end in that sense, even though COVID is dying down in some ways, but it's still there. It's not going away. 
and there's still a lot that we don't know about it that we're still trying to, for them to, under, to understand how it works because it is mutating and there's no perfect vaccine yet. Mm -hmm. We still need to be advocating for the safety of everybody across the board. Okay, yeah. post COVID or pre COVID or wherever or during COVID, whatever the situation is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. and if if you if in my notes I say to you wear and I request that you wear an N95, and if you don't have it, I have them. I can provide it to you, and then you come out and you're wearing the surgical that I didn't request. It immediately puts me into stress mm -hmm. because it's in my notes. I know you saw it in my notes when you came to get me. Yeah, but you chose to wear that one because, and then you say to me, "Oh, this is okay." Then I then it puts me into a spiral. Yes, it puts me into a spiral. Yeah. Why? Yeah, and then I have to go into my whole story of the last year why I need you to do this. I don't need to do that at my appointment. I just need mm -hmm. to get in quickly and out because I made a really early appointment, so I'm the first there. Yeah, and my arguing with you now has extended my appointment, making me be in the space where I don't want to be for a longer time yeah if you had just done what I said mm -hmm. instead of bring your whatever it is your personal take on it I don't need to hear your personal thing yes and just ask you for that 10-15 minutes to just accommodate me yeah right yeah. it goes back to kind of customer service um as much as we hate it sometimes the customer is always right <laughs> <laughs> Kind of that same mentality yeah. of just please for 15 to 30 minutes, just for our safety, for our safety, or even peace of mind, just wear a mask. You know, mm -hmm. you can take it off when you're done before you go to the next patient, but just mm -hmm. please wash your hands. Please wear a mask to keep it safe and just be respectful of people's wishes too. I think, you know, even if it wasn't a mask, but what if it's something else? What if there's something else that would help the appointment go smoother for their peace of mind that you could, that they could do? Mm -hmm. and that they've maybe already written down and called in I mean the fact that you're making these phone calls and mm -hmm. that you're writing this stuff down you know really trying to be detailed to help them have the information they need to make the situation um more calm and fluid and safe for you and the fact that they're not doing it that's that's so frustrating and it's not okay so no. you know for those of you listening um again this is not a rant to say that everybody's wrong and that we're trying to point the finger or anything but we are just trying to raise some awareness of our point of view about as you know as caregiver entrepreneurs and dealing with situate a lot of dealing with situations where um the immune system is very delicate it's been like for, especially for cancer you know like your immune system gets shot when you go through radiation or chemo treatments do so even a cold could be the tipping scale of a massive hospitalization um other you know other uh, there's a, a, lots of other immunocompromised um uh, illnesses out there too it um, I can't think of nothing else is coming to yeah, light right now, but still it's important, you know, like when you're dealing with the immune system, it's very delicate because it can crash very, very fast. So you want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and that you're, so that way you can take so that way in twofold, you're taking care of the one that you're loving, that your, that your loved one, um, that the loved one that you're caring for um, has as well. And the same thing is as in the healthcare system, you know, we need to be, you know, we want to obviously keep our cell, ourselves healthy and safe so we can, so we're not taking it to our families, but we certainly don't want it. Certainly as a medical professional, you know, it's our job to make sure that our patients or clients are not being affected adversely by something unsafe that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it means being a little uncomfortable. Believe me, when we were in the thick of COVID, I did not like wearing a mask either when I could, when I was giving showers and I was bathing my patients, that was terrible because, you know, it gets humid in the shower room. My glasses are fogging up. I'm wearing this, um, uh, gown that's, um, that's made of material that makes me, you know, even more hot and uncomfortable. And so it feels, you know, you feel hot, you feel like you're in a sauna and having to work in those conditions, but I still did it. So sometimes you have to, to have the best interest at heart. Sometimes you do have to be a little uncomfortable, be a little uncomfortable to, for the greater grit. It's not fun, but sometimes that's what you need to do. And it could be, and, it, and it's definitely better to go that route and be respectful of someone than not. Yeah, exactly. I think you put it perfectly. Um, and I think to touch on it a, a little bit more um, before, because um, we also wanted to discuss our project, the Black and Still COVIDing project and our open call, but um, when my mom, 
well she's always had issues of like high blood pressure and um you know strokes run on in our family on her on um from your, your side of the family um and when she got told that you're at high risk of multiple myeloma which is a rare blood cancer right for those who don't know um that was in 2015 and we saw that her white blood cell count went down and like, you need to be very cautious this could we don't know what's going on here you need to check your protein levels all this stuff and so her white blood cells have gone up down up down and especially last year um thankfully most of the time they were stable but she was still high risk because of all the stress on her system that it could you know plummeted so we always have been cautious since 2015 well in general but especially 2015 when she got that diagnosis of like this is you have the marker for this cancer and beforehand because of my experience of bullying and stuff and be, having to become homeschooled online I became high risk because my doctors were checking me to see if I had Addison's disease and it wasn't until like a, two months ago finally after like over 10 years of being checked for Addison's are like okay we're um you're you're actually stabilizing so we don't think you're at risk anymore but you have to be cautious that your cortisol levels drop and that could put you at risk um so on top of that i've had issues with my lymph nodes and like getting swollen and and having being high risk because of mental illness because mental illness caused so much stress on your system complex ptsd or ptsd especially is puts you at risk of getting really sick and so I've had, in a way, I'm immunocompromised as well. My my dad is as well. So we've had to be very cautious over the years because I've seen my mom when she's gotten like a simple, like a flu or a simple cold, and suddenly it could go into bronchitis and blood and mucus and things like that from coughing. So we've had to be very cautious over the years. And so when masking came into healthcare, we were like, this now makes it easier for us to receive care. Um, because now we're like not so worried about being exposed. And so now with all these other things circulating and 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 COVID still being here, it's like, you know, asking that simple request of like, hey, for this appointment, you know our history, you know that it's not just these immune uh immunocompromising issues like high blood pressure, high blood pressure. asthma, and things like that, and that diabetes, but it's also the mental health part that when you have three mental health diagnoses of like uh for us we have the same we have diagnosis. the same diagnosis that means that we are extra high risk because then when you have that pan panic disorder and stuff you're getting panic attacks that's putting so much stress on your system on top of the other health issues that it can make it even worse for you so absolutely and i because well think about it whole body self-care what does that mean mind mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. and soul mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. So yeah. if you know if, if the pendulum is swinging either way in extremes, it's going to be a house of cards. You know your body's going to um, you know your body's going to um, handle it in one shape, way, or form or another, and it could be more than likely having you know a massive health issue. Like with my husband, um, he just got a new diagnosis um, for non-epileptic seizure. And so, and basically that is, it's like, you know, he, when he has, when he deals with stress, same kind of thing, instead of it manifesting with maybe a panic attack or a heart attack or something like that, it manifests for him with a seizure. And yes, he does have epilepsy. And so we do have to control that diagnosis, but now we have to also control this and just be aware that you know, for him, he just, you know, he did not, he has to watch how he copes with his stress and his um, anxiety, you know, because it will, otherwise it could manifest himself the hard way, like we just now recently learned after being diagnosed, getting him diagnosed with it, is that that's the ultimate bad thing. I I understand it a little bit too. I have IBS. Stress is the number one trigger for my IBS symptoms. And I get a lot of stress as a caregiver and a mom. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and a wife and also building my business so you know it's it's it for people that understand who aren't in the healthcare healthcare space as much that when you're talking about the immune system um it can get hit in many different ways it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be an actual physical global illness but mental and emotional do impact and stress is a big factor of it and it's like once you for some reason once you have one chronic illness, you usually get another one. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in when I was 22 and 
10 years later, you know, 10 plus years later, I got hit with IBS and I've had that diagnosis for two years now. So hello, it, it, it really kind of, once the gate, the gateway is opened, unfortunately, once you have one diagnosis, it unfortunately is the gateway to others. Now there's things we can try to do obviously to take care of ourselves. So we stop it from turning into a massive, more snowball than what we want it to, but we can't do it without the help of people around us helping us whether it is family friends um coaches support groups you know collaborations like what um insista creatives and i are doing obviously but still we do need some help from the medical system of how can we bring this to, into the limelight a little bit more to where it is streamlined to where you know we are safe and we can and because when we're safe we have peace of mind knowing our loved one Exactly. But anyway, I want to hear about this project. You guys have been harping on this a little bit, and I want to hear about where you're taking Insista Creatives and what you have coming up for the rest of 2023, because it sounds like you've been doing, going through some shifts like we talked about at the beginning of this episode, that you guys are going through some amazing shifts um, to really get to the root of what you feel like the Lord has laid on your heart for one and two, just of how you can do it better, because I know that's certainly been the case for me since the beginning of this year of just finally listening and in, listening to that intuition and going, okay, I'm going to stop writing it and I'm going to go the way I'm supposed to go uh, to serve um, my audience and clientele. So what has been, so what's your story with that? Where, where are you being shifted and refined and molded into now? Yeah. Um, so like what we were discussing with like the um, COVID emergency orders going away and stuff, um, uh, right a couple weeks before that we started joining various dis disability communities um particularly um this group called um still coveting and it was just groups of disabled people um meeting online through zoom every weekend and they had a small break breakout room called um black and still coveting and it was like a new breakout room so we went there and we started meeting all these other black folks who were um high risk um, or just want to protect themselves because they know someone in their family um, who is high risk or they were worried about, well, if I catch this, this is going to cause more health issues and I don't have good health care, you know, things like that. Um, and so we started really supporting each other and we were like, well, we're hearing all these stories and we realized we're not alone. We felt so alone in, in, in this um this this fight and this experience, especially with my mom's cancer and everything I discussed, you know, just minutes before. And we, at the time where we were working on our open call for our Art and Mind series, and we were like, okay, we have to do some shifting. We we were had more focus on Black women, then we were like, okay, let's open it to um, Black, Indigenous, a woman of color, you know, opening it more to, to women of color in general and femme expressing creatives of color um to submit and through that shifting and stuff and we looked more at um disability and accessibility we were like wow mas masking is a access issue because mm -hmm. it makes it so people who are high risk can't go into certain spaces mm -hmm. and when masking became a thing it made it so immunocompromised people people who were homebound could finally come out of their homes you know when they had the energy to and be like well i could go to this event i can go to to this um, doctor's appointment feel safer. I could go to this um, concert, whatever, right? So as we're hearing these stories and as we were networking, we connected to NAACP Manchester because we're, we're in New Hampshire. Um, and we were like, hmm, let's present some stories because maybe this is a way that we could advocate because before we were just going to talk about our art and what we're doing. And so we put out this call um, a couple of days before May 11th when everything was supposed to end. And we said, hey, we're talking to the NAACP, we're a black owned project, we're immunocompromised, we're, we have chronic health issues. We wanna hear your stories. Why do you think it's important to have um, <clears throat> medical professionals wear masks when they interact with you? Why do you think it's important to have, still have masked events? So then, you know, you're not homebound, like, or virtual events, right? Or hybrid events. And so within like five or six days, we got 23 stories. And we jumped from like 150 or so followers or 250 or something to like 400 within a month. And now we're about to almost about to hit like 500. And we're like, wait, where'd all these people come from? Because 
we realized we didn't have a lot of, we didn't really have a disability audience even though we were talking about this disability we didn't have a disabled audience mostly we had some and once we opened up and said this is our experience we want people to feel less alone everyone's like oh my god <laughs> and especially because we're like whoa oh, black people are talking about this like they didn't even know that there were people of you know people of color black people that black women who were talking about disability from this perspective of invisible disability and so people started messaging us like i'm so glad i found you guys i love you guys i love what you're doing i felt so alone mm -hmm. i i have lost my family i've lost this and that mm -hmm. i have been able to perform as a musician i can't do my poetry i can't go into art galleries because there's access issues and on top of that the masking's going away so we're hearing all these stories and we got to present it to the person who was in charge of the health committee at NAACP, who's still masked and, and still cautious um, because they have family who's at risk. And now we have been able to have a you know correspondence with them trying to figure out, OK, what can we do to help with their program? And it still is very slow, but we're finding Talking. ways and having those talks. Mm -hmm. And now we are able to uh, eventually, you know, work on our, our sponsors, Nancy Queerly and Brain Arts Org and talk about, well, accessibility and mask events and understanding the intersections of like, of inclusivity isn't just having diversity in race and gender and, and, and things like that. It's about disability, understanding that disability is multifaceted, mm -hmm. that access, access needs are not just limited to ASL and wheelchairs, but it's also making sure it's safe for those who are immunocompromised, who are recovering from cancer, are going through cancer, have chronic illness, immune, autoimmune disease, and that they can feel safe going to a place too that has good ventilation, clean air, mm -hmm. you know, masking, things like that. Especially, especially if it's a disabled, disability focused event. And so mm -hmm. from then we have seen so many organizations um, having mass events, having um, virtual events that talk about these issues, finding ways to give people masks for free, giving tests for free, um, educating people on accessibility, um, especially for Pride Month. And so we're like, whoa, this is, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. And now we get to be part of that. And so now we feel like less alone. Mm -hmm. and feel like we've actually found our niche which is disability and, our peeps. and our peeps yeah <laughs> that we have realized that disability is not only a major part of our mission it always has but specifically those who are being left behind because they have invisible illnesses so that's kind of what we're doing and yeah. we're hoping that we you know we get more stories we're working on it everything's on our site black and still coveting it's a page on our site on our Instagram and people can view the slideshow and the, and our call to action and things like that on our site and see what's going on. And we hope to eventually turn it into a little video series, yeah. you know, and yeah. yeah. And I love it. Well, and you know what, um, Arminthia, I just have to compliment you. Yeah. I love when you see you light up when you get passionate about talking about what your calling is, because I feel like you finally have found it. The way you lit up, and that is definitely what I want caregiving what I what I'm excited to share on caregiving and entrepreneurship reimagined just because illness you have been touched by illness whether it's you or you're the caregiver of somebody that yeah. is immunocompromised or or even just sick and you're having to be segue into that role of being a caregiver without a medical background yeah. life doesn't stop you still need something for you and it is okay it does not have to be a choice between pursuing your passion be it an online business like what you know you guys and I have you and I have chosen to do and care for your loved one you can have both it does not have to do it does not have to be a choice and that's what I love that you guys are exemplifying you guys are both sick yep. and you're still blowing it out of the water what you doubled your followers and you got 23 stories in the matter of a week hello talk about the Lord just ordaining you and mm -hmm. saying okay you guys have chosen to be obedient and use my and raise a voice to advocate for others and share your story and to find a way to still give you something to keep fighting for, even though crap has hit the wall for you in so many ways because of your health. Instead of laying down and and not and and just giving in, you're choosing to fight. 
exactly yeah. and you're like choosing to fight and that is what i want people to understand the caregiver caregivers and entrepreneurs listen to me like y'all buckle up get ready to go <laughs> um that is what caregiving and entrepreneurship reimagined is about i want you guys to realize you can still pursue a passion mm-hmm. and still care for your loved one and and not neglect yourself your mm-hmm. physical mental emotional and spiritual self yeah, it's I like, know for me, the last three years sorry, sorry. Yeah. during this work that I'm doing, I've been through my massive shift. I've been, the Lord's been really working on me since January. And I finally listened and got some skin in the game last month. It still kept me going to have this outlet to share my story and to share my heart of how I can help people of using God, the God-given talents and gifts that I've gotten. And sometimes it is a, it is a, um, the imagery I had this morning in my devotional, this is so perfect, um, uh, was, was the image of a potter, a, po- a, 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 some, a potter who, you know, he's spinning his wheel and he's molding the pot into the unique shape and size and dimension that he feels is right. The same is true with our journey as caregivers and entrepreneurs. We're being molded, we're being refined, we're being put, we're being refined through the fire as the journey unfolds and sometimes it is like what we're both going through with our businesses being shifted and rebranded and niching down more specifically to then just run with what we're supposed to do and I applaud you for both of that because that is hard to do it's not easy because it's really stuffed it's really hard as an entrepreneur to, to step out and do something that's new it's like okay this is not what I had in mind but I choose to trust it go with and go with my god-given talent and just listen to my intuition and listen to myself. And I love that. I love that you're listening to your calling, listening to what God and the universe have set before you and you're running with it. And that is so beautiful. And it, you're going to get to touch so many people's lives because you're choosing to be obedient. Cause that's when you are blessed most when is when you're obedient to the calling. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, sorry to interrupt you before, but it is like, um, I remember when I first came out to the hospital and I still had my, I had my brace on for eight weeks. And as I came home, they couldn't figure out how to get me into the house. I had to learn how to get into the house. They had to, I had to set up a stool for me to, on the steps to get into the house. And then once I was in the house, I had to use uh, my walker or in, in the house. And then one of the nurses said to me, well, you can take your wheelchair and put your wheelchair in front of the TV and I was like no I'm not if I start putting the t- wheelchair in front of the TV and having meals in my wheelchair and everything I'm not going to I'm not going to see myself walking I'm gonna sit there on the wheelchair and have my meals in the TV so that wheelchair is going to go into the garage and the only time it's going to be used is when I'm going out I'm going to use my walker in the house. And when I have my meals, I'll sit on my bed and have my meals. And it was like, she said to me, well, another time, the, the another person said to me, um, I said, I'm going to be walking by the summer. And they were like, oh, you, that's too much. And yourself. you're getting ahead of yourself. And it's like, you have to envision yourself doing better. You have yeah. to envision yourself doing better. You, you can't these tools, these accessibility tools that we have are to, to help us to get up and to do better and to, you know, to, to be able to do things, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to become dependent on them. When they're telling you that. When they're telling you that. You, you, you can, you, sh- you will be able to yeah, walk again. When you're being told exactly. that you're in that 1% that can walk again, then that's so rare. It's like, well, then I'm not, I'm not going to accept um, a medical professional telling me oh no you know you're getting ahead of yourself and discouraging you like that's not right yeah so it's like it's, it's not like, like you're, you're it's impossible for you to walk you're being told you can yeah so so it's like you the, gotta make those baby steps you gotta make the baby yeah steps. what is baby it? steps to yeah. massive action exactly yeah. that's what exactly. it is with our business you, you know you can't sit back and say oh okay i'm going to sit here and wait till I'm just going to sit here and it's going to happen. You actually have to put the work in. Mm-hmm. Yep. And even though, um, even though it, 
might not make sense to other people what you're doing. Yep. If you feel passionate about it inside, even from a from from a place of disability, what is stopping you? If you have everything else, you have everything else, you have the passion that you can do it, find a way. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like how it was in my mom's time. And we have so many different ways in my parents' time, we have so many different ways to access things and to be to mm -hmm. to to move forward. Mm -hmm. And so with with what we do, you know, with what we do, we want to really we want people to really understand that disability, there's invisible disability, there's visible disability. And because you can't see someone's disability doesn't mean they're not disabled. You know what I'm saying? And so if you see, for me, when I go out and I have to you, I have to use my kin or whatever, you can see that disability, but you can't see my daughter's disability, No. Mm -hmm. you know? So someone might help me with the door, right? When I go out, because they can see my kid, but they're not going to help my daughter with the door. And so these are all the different things that we have to combat as people who have disabilities as we go out into able body, uh, able bodied world. To not assume. To not, people are just always assuming and then you get, people get into fights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. No, I hear you. I mean, you look at my husband, you wouldn't know he has, he's been struggling with epilepsy for four years. No, you wouldn't no. know. <laughs> No. You know, and and people wouldn't know just looking at me like that. I, I, I have to watch my stress because I'm a caregiver and an entrepreneur and I have an underlying health condition. I have two that can crash my immune system, you know, IBS and hypothyroidism, you know, exactly. perception is everything. You know, yeah. we, we only, when you look at someone, you only see a fraction, a fraction of what um, the person is actually dealing with. Yeah. So, so that's why we are doing this work. This work yeah. is bringing attention to all these types of disabilities for yeah. people to understand. Absolutely. Basically Absolutely. To force our way into the arts and into this kind of work because it was there was nothing for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was, that accessibility wasn't there, especially when it comes to art galleries and things like that. They're not considering disabilities majority of the time, but especially invisible disabilities. They don't even think about sensory issues or mental illness mm -hmm. and how that affects how you interact with things in a facility or how um certain stressors can occur that you you can't enjoy the space and yeah, so exactly. we're like you know what we had to do it for ourselves we had to force our way and be like you, no one's doing it for us when we go to people and, and say hey this is what you need to do they're not listening so because they're coming from an able-bodied perspective so we have to do it and so yeah, again, going back to that niche of realizing, oh, we need to really, mm -hmm. really hyper-focus on disability, mm -hmm. especially for those of color, especially for those who are survivors of trauma, who are marginalized in some form. Mm -hmm. Like, we mm -hmm. have to do that. And yeah, it's been a, a blessing that within a month, we're like, have shifted or become, I would say, even stronger in our mission to help marginalized women, marginalized genders mm -hmm. and heal in, in yes. the arts because it's, accessibility is a hard thing to take on because Absolutely. it's always ever it's ever changing it's so many people have different needs so you're gonna always have to adjust and i'm getting my charger um no, and, that's and, fine well yeah. well and i'm gonna say that as an entrepreneur there's always life in general there's always going to be somebody that's going to be cr cranky because you're not doing x y and z well mm -hmm. it's just the way the world works yeah. so how can you so that doesn't matter. What matters is that you're being obedient to the Lord, to God, however you choose to believe for me, it's the Lord. So what comes down, to what I, the way I see it is, are you obedient, obedient to your spirit, to the voice that you, that you're being, the mission, the work that's been laid on your heart first and foremost, and are you taking action on it to try to make it better for somebody else? And you're doing that. You're hitting both. So whatever happens following this podcast episode, following this Instagram live, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. You're being yeah. obedient. You're taking action. You're being open and curious because that's part of it. I, you know, with being a caregiver and an entrepreneur, you have to be curious and open to however it's going to happen because lots of times, like especially dealing with uh, with our situations, dealing with incurable illness, it just moves day by day. Just, okay, what's the ebb and flow going to be with today? I don't know, but I'm going to just figure it out and I will figure this out somehow. Same thing with entrepreneurship. I mean, I've been at this for three years and I'm daily learning. How can I do it better? 
And I never for a million years <laughs> when I started this thought I would be marketing myself as a caregiver and a business coach, but I am living, that's what I'm living. I'm building my business and my talent is encouraging and inspiring people. And so I'm going to stand in that truth and I'm not going to let anyone dissuade me from that, no matter what someone says, because I know that's what God is wanting me to do. That's what the whole month of May he showed me. It was just, it was just so interesting how the devotionals that I was going through in my Bible study correlated so well with where I was at in my mind with my business. It's like the Lord was saying, are you listening yet? This is where I want you to go. You just need to be obedient and, and take that step and risk. The word that's been coming to my mind a lot has been risk. Are you willing to risk the judgment, the fear, the yeah. disappointment mm -hmm. to move into your highest self and the version of yourself of where you're meant to be and where God is calling you to be? That's really what it comes down to. Yes. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be someone who says you shouldn't do that or I can do it better at doing it like X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. As long as you're standing into your truth and your light and you're moving forward in that and you're being obedient to it. That's all that really matters. There's not really anything else that matters yeah. to it. So ladies, I am so excited that you guys came onto the podcast again today because this is so important. This is important work. I am very excited to see 2023 is not, 2023 is not over yet. I am more than thrilled and excited to see where you guys are going to be by the time we hit December because God has already obviously opened up the gateway within a month for you. That tells me that he has a hand on this of where he of her, he wants you to go. So anyways, but yeah, drop. Um, so where can we follow again? What Drop your handle for your website and your um, uh, Instagram real quick for our listeners. So they can go follow you and seeing what, what you're up to. Yeah. Um, so our website is sistacreativesrising.com. Our Instagram is sistacreativesrising. LinkedIn, same thing, sistacreativesrising. Um, and we have our open call out. So if we're looking for um, women of color and femme expressing creatives of color share their stories um, about their experiences with art and healing, especially around disability and mental health and any other struggles that they've had and how they've used art to heal. So that's paying 200 each to five artists that we choose. And that's closing on July 1st. And let's go to our site, our Instagram, and you'll see everything there. And we have again, focus on accessibility. So um, things are captioned, we have guides and everything, and we're open to any questions that you have. So you can email us too. So I love that. And you know what the interesting thing about that is? My new program drops on July 26th. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess July is going to be our big month for us, for both of us. So that's really yeah. exciting. So yes. Yeah, so speaking of which, if you are struggling as a caregiver, as an entrepreneur, and you're stuck on how to do it, how to figure this out, my brand new coaching program, Caregiving and Entrepreneurship Reimagined, drops on July 26th. The waitlist is open at programs, Melissa Miller, 2011.com. Or if you're rewatching this on Instagram or my YouTube channel, the links will be in the description below or in my link and bio. And I want to help you and encourage you along in your journey as a caregiver, as an entrepreneur, to know that you are not alone. I want to help you save time and money by getting organized. I want to help you prioritize your mind, body, and soul every day so you don't burn out and can show up for your loved one and your clients. And I want to help you ease the stress of when the unexpected happens, be it a medical emergency or something else in your business. Things don't always go as planned. That's life. That's the nature of being a caregiver and an entrepreneur. And I want you to get, just be able to give yourself grace when things don't go as you plan. So be sure to um, join the wait list. You'll find it on my website or in my link and bio if you're watching this on Instagram or in the YouTube description or wherever you're watching this on the podcast. And thank you, Arminthia and Claire, my special guests for season three, episode two of the Caregiving and Entrepreneurship Reimagined podcast. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you for listening. And I will see you in the next episode. Thank Bye. you.